Welcome to the gardening workshop at the Tapeport Community Garden. In this May edition, we hear from Dr. Courtney Giles, a soil scientist from the Hutton Institute. This is the recording of her introductory talk about one of the key plant nutrients, phosphorus. This is followed by a question and answer session with the audience. The rest of the workshop included hands-on testing of our soil samples for phosphorus levels and pH. And at the very end, we had some fun with a phosphorus game illustrating factors that affect availability of phosphorus in the soil. You can read more about that in the blog associated with this recording. Now, Courtney started off by telling us about Green Revolution and how this was fueled by advances in agricultural science in the 1950s. Some of the significant innovations have involved the development of commercial fertilizers, which have allowed us to increase how productive our food systems are. Phosphorus has been an important part of this. So, to put this in a little bit of historical context, um, this is a graph which I'll pass around, but basically it shows sources of phosphorus fertilizers since the 1800s to present. And there's this big spike, as you'll see, that's blue. And this is starting about in the 1950s, where the Green Revolution started. Um, and this is a transition from manure and guano and other organic forms of fertilizers to phosphate rock. So these are mineral sources of phosphorus that are mined from the earth and processed, and then they're distributed to farmers and you know, to gardeners to grow food. So you can see this, this huge spike in how that shift has happened. <coughs> and with that, because all of this, this little picture here is it's kind of a gray blob, but it's a picture of a phosphate mine. So this is where a lot of our inorganic fertilizers come from. And the majority of those occur in Africa, in China, and there are some in the U.S. Um, Iran has recently claimed that they have some very large reserves of phosphorus. And, and basically, first of all, that this means that Phosphorus fertilizers, the majority of them, are non-renewable, right? And to remove them from the earth requires an immense amount of energy and fossil fuels. So there's a huge carbon footprint, there's a huge issue with the sustainability of this. And have you all heard about peak oil, I assume, right? So the same thing, the same concept has been extended to phosphorus because this is a finite resource, and it's expected to be depleted at some point. And some estimates say as early as 50 years, peak phosphorus. Some are now projecting further out um, beyond this century. But just like oil, this depends very much on what the estimates of the phosphorus mm -hmm. reserves are and things like that. And this, these two little colored donuts are basically the, the consumers of phosphorus, so these are countries that consume phosphorus, each color is a different country. So you can see some, like South Asia, consume a lot of phosphorus. And these are uh, the producers. And those donuts don't really look the same as far as the colors are distributed, right? So, for example, Africa, this red portion, has the largest proportion of the phosphorus supply globally, but they're, they don't even really show up on the consumer side of the chart. Yeah, yeah, most of it's Morocco, Northern Africa, yeah. And this, I'll bet maybe somebody who's seen this image before knows what I'm talking about might know what this, this streak is. The phosphorus savvy might. So that is actually a satellite image of the Sahara Desert, where there's a train line going from a phosphate mine to the coast, and the wind has swept all of that mineral off <coughs> of the desert, and it leaves a streak. So that's huge waste, obviously, but it shows you the magnitude of, of what's being extracted from the earth.
Um, so, so there's a lot of imbalance, right, with, with the sources and the use of phosphorus for fertilizer. And the, the more global concern about this is that this can lead to some geopolitical conflict. Because phosphorus, we, we, do, we rely so heavily on phosphorus for producing food that the countries and the governments that control these sources have a lot of power over the production of food on a global scale. So many governments, you know, are very, very concerned about securing these resources for themselves. Um, so my point is that it's, it's quite important where, where our phosphorus comes from. Um, we rely on it heavily for food production and it's non-renewable, so um, there's, there's a need to come up with some alternative measures um, for using it more efficiently. So I'm going to pass that around. And as I'm saying, on a global scale, so if you look at the availability of phosphorus in soils, right? So some of you may be aware that you can test your soils for the concentration of phosphorus that's considered plant available. And, and based on how much phosphorus is there, um, there are recommendations for how much more should be applied. And ideally, you would add enough phosphorus or enough fertilizer so that you're adding just enough for the plants to grow but not too much because you wouldn't want to waste it. And this is just a map where the areas in red are where the soil phosphorus concentration is very high. And, and you can see that, so in areas of Europe, where historically we've, we've added a lot of fertilizer over time, so that it tends to accumulate. And we have surplus levels of phosphorus in many of our soils. And then again, this kind of illustrates the imbalance. This blue area in northern Africa, very, very deficient mineral soils but they don't have the resources to purchase the fertilizers to, to apply it. Um, and, as I was saying, it's very important to add the correct amount of fertilizer to your soil so that you're not adding too much. And here in Europe and in the U.S. and now moving into China, where the resources are available to purchase fertilizers and apply them. The, the mantra in agriculture has kind of become more is better, you know? So, so if we're trying to produce higher yields of food or crops or whatever, um, just keep adding more fertilizer and, and that'll do it, right? Um, what happens, though, is that if you over-apply, your plants aren't necessarily going to grow better, and they'll be an accumulation. And so this is another illustration quite similar to the previous one, where this is showing sources of imbalance. So here, red areas are surpluses, and blue areas are areas of deficit. So where there's just not enough to grow enough food. And the areas of surplus are really dangerous environmentally because those are sources of nutrient pollution. And if you've ever seen pictures of these really intense uh, algal blooms in some bays or oceans or ponds or lakes or whatever, um, this, this is one of the reasons for that. Because historically there's been over application of fertilizers and a lot of that gets swept off into surface waters and, and you have these, um, these detrimental effects on the ecosystem. And just to illustrate how adding too much phosphorus might uh, relate in terms of plant growth, this is a common experiment that's done to determine what the optimal level of phosphorus is for a particular plant in a particular soil. And this is how a lot of the agronomic recommendations, this is what this it's based on. Basically what you do is 
you add increasing levels of fertilizer to the soil. So along the bottom axis, increasing levels of fertilizer to the soil. And you grow the plants in that soil to yield or to a certain point. You harvest them and then you determine what their dry weight is or how much phosphorus they've taken up or whatever metric it is that you're looking for. And so what you see, if this is a plot, is that at low levels of phosphorus being added, low levels of fertilizer, you see a really rapid response in growth. So the plants are taking this up, they're responding quickly, um, they're growing more quickly as you increase that fertilizer. But at a certain point, you reach a plateau where adding more doesn't help. So most of the recommendations are based on uh, about where, wherever this turn is, where the plateau begins, and that's called the critical phosphorus level for a particular plant. And basically, any gardener or farmer doesn't have to do this themselves anymore because there are agronomic services that will provide consultation on these sorts of things. And often, it can be as easy as doing a soil test, measuring phosphorus concentration in your soil, considering what plant you're trying to grow there, and then there are published recommendations for how much more you should add. You might wonder, you know, how, what you could do to improve your phosphorus use, the sustainability of your gardening, specifically concerning phosphorus. And this is a really oh. nice plot of that. So um, some researchers projected um, what could become alternative sources of fertilizers moving into the future. And so here we're moving again from 1950 onward. And this is the, the projected need, right? So eventually we're going to need um, 70 megatons per acre of phosphorus to maintain food production for, for example, a population of 9 billion people. And this red bit along the bottom, that's rock phosphate, that's mineral phosphate, what we were talking about. And so this little hump is peak phosphorus. So then how do we fill that gap beyond that peak, right? And what they've suggested is, well, you could reuse phosphorus, you could use manures, so that's this section. Reuse human excreta, composting toilets, for example. Reuse crop residues, so this could be turning plants back into the soil or green manures. Um, reuse food in other ways, so many of us are already doing that with composting, so that's very good. Um, and then this blue is are a bit more extreme or would require more social change. So changing diets, uh, improving efficiency within the food chain, so not wasting as we, you know, remove food from the ground to producing it. You know, food, food production waste is huge. Can I ask about the changing of the diet? Which, what diet is There's been quite wasteful. a lot of research on um, vegetarian diets and those being having a smaller ecological footprint and that includes phosphorus as well it includes phosphorus yeah. as well yes so it's recommended for carbon footprints it's re theory. yes it's recommended for carbon footprints it's also recommended for phosphorus footprints okay yeah. um and that's and that's mainly because i mean I, I, if you know anything about the vegetarian diets in terms of carbon footprints it's related to how much energy it takes to produce the food for the animals mm. and the transport of the animals and, and things like that. In terms of phosphorus, producing the food for the animals also takes into account extracting mineral phosphate, transporting it to the field to grow the food and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, but I'm happy to talk about any of those nuances. Um, and then just increasing efficiency of mining and fertilizer production, right? But I think the things that we could all contribute towards this is, is not over applying too much of our fertilizers and trying to find alternative sources of fertilizers like compost and manures and that sort of thing. Are there any questions about 
everything that I just bombarded with. <laughs> Do we actually need any inorganic phosphorus at all? Could we manage entirely without it? It does help because it's, it is the most available. So if you have um, a crop or a plant that's really struggling, it's useful to have, to have some there. Um, but the source, the alternative source has a big effect. So for example, cow manure is as high as 90% in organic phosphorus. So it already has a lot of that very available phosphorus and that will be easily taken up by the plant. The issue with manures, of course, is that there's pathogens, potentially. So that's why composting is a good idea in any case, because the composting process raises the temperature so much that it kills off a lot of the pathogens. So it's always recommended that you do that first um, instead of adding straight manure, if it's something that you're going to eat immediately um, at harvest. Um, but there are some alternative sources, like for example, poultry manure, which actually is very different in terms of its phosphorus availability. And our manure is very different in terms of its phosphorus availability. And it has to do with our digestive systems. Mm. So a cow has a rumen, right? So it's a big digestion vat. And as it eats hay and grain and everything else, it just digests and digests and digests. And what comes out the other end is very available phosphorus. Mm. Us, we only have one stomach. And we actually don't have the ability to break down the forms of phosphorus that are in grains and seeds. It's, or, it's organic phosphorus, so that means there, it's not just phosphorus and oxygen, it's phosphorus and oxygen and carbon, and we don't absorb that, and we don't have the enzymes or the means of breaking that down. So most of the phosphorus that we pass and that chickens pass that are also single stuff um, will not be available, and you really would need to digest that further before it were available. So if you have a source of manure and you're not sure, you might um, just ask yourself if it's a ruminant. <laughs> that's, a, that's a quick way. And if it's not, or if it's your own, then you're probably going to want to compost it for much longer. Yeah. And you can, you can have tests done as well to see what, what proportion of the phosphorus should be immediately available. Yeah. Horse manure is also quite available. Yeah, same thing. They have, I don't know what it's called, but it's like, it's like there's, it doesn't, it's not a rumen, but they have kind of an intermediate organ that is before the stomach. So they're not single stomach, but they have something else that's like a small rumen. But I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Talk about recovery from sewage. Yeah. Does that come with other problems? Because I mean, there's lots yes. of things in sewage that you don't want to put back in. Yes, exactly. And, um, yeah, there's been quite a lot of research on that, actually, in the UK as well, because it's actually not that it's not safe. It's I think that public perception isn't up to speed. So, I mean, the concern is that in our sewage there could be other pharmaceuticals or other pathogens or heavy metals, heavy metals and things like that, yes. Um, but the form that they come out in in the sewage, depending on it depends on the source and it has to be tested, but there are some forms of sewage and some treatments for sewage, I'm fairly sure that can be applied safely. But it's just like, you know, the raw cow manure where you want to take it through an additional step to get it to a safe place. There are methods for doing this with raw sewage, but then once you get to that point, there's still a lot of public pushback, I think, in, in terms of people being comfortable with applying sewage. Mm -hmm. drink water. Right. That's no, no, I know, but that's the thing. It's, yeah. it, it is. It's, and, and actually, I think it's really important for all of us to get our heads around things like that, you know, when, when we're going to have fewer and fewer options. You know, so you have to be kind of open-minded to 
to alternative ways of, of growing your food and sources of fertilizers and things like that.